This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So I have the real pleasure in this uh, part-time gig of mine being your radio host every night at 6 o'clock on Saga 960 of introducing you two and meeting myself, some fascinating people. And uh, Madeline Lamont is a Toronto-based uh, artist who's just spectacular. And I think it'll be really quite interesting uh, um, meeting her, learning a little bit about uh, her background and how she got into art and, and what some of her art is. And so it's a real pleasure of me, uh, of mine tonight to introduce you to Madeline Lamont. Madeline, how are you? Welcome to the show. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Excellent. Thank you so much. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Madeline, uh, if I could. Um, she's uh, based here in uh, Toronto. Um, she uh, got into art with a, uh, a BFA degree from York University. Madeline, what is a BFA degree? A Bachelor of Fine Arts. And, uh, oh. and tell me, what do you learn in fine arts? Well, uh, you have studio programs, you have, uh, you know, for example, like printmaking or painting, drawing, etc. Uh, then you have a, a lot of art history. And, um, you know, it's a program that's basically introducing you to uh, being an artist. And I think it's very useful because you get to meet other like minded people. Why did you decide to do that? Well, I've always been probably an artist. Like I've always drawn, I've always painted. Um, my mother was an actor, a working actor, quite successful working actor. And when I wanted to do fine arts, she said, okay, you need to do something practical first. And so fresh out of uh, high school, or I, I guess a, a year after, I did a graphic design and commercial art program. And I think that really prepared me for, first of all, being able to support myself when I'm young and, you know, uh, unknown or unestablished and uh, also gave me a skill set that wasn't necessarily being given to artists in art schools at that time. Um, so when I graduated, I guess, in the 1990s, um, it was a part of the uh, conceptual art and installation art, and a lot of sculpture. And uh, I have always been a fairly representational painter. So I came to that with, a, with um, a, a, a ideas and knowledge of, of how I wanted to paint. And then from there was exposed to ideas and was able to, you know, um, go in different directions. So it gave me a very good founding. Uh, basis to go into art school. What's a representational painter? Well, a realism. You know, we sometimes call it a uh, high real, like this is representational. Like there's an object in it that you can see, um, you can make out what it is. It's not abstract necessarily. You can move, some of it can be sort of fairly abstract. And when you talk about figurative art, you're talking about sort of more object you can see what it is. And then, you know, when you talk about abstract or abstract expressionist artists, it's, it's a movement away from realism. Michelle Lamont, as I mentioned, received her BFA degree from York University in Toronto. She also got a Canadian commercial art and design diploma for, from Algonquin College in Ottawa. She has exhibited her work in museums and galleries, both nationally and internationally, and has been the recipient of numerous grants and awards from the Toronto Arts Council and the Ontario Arts Council and the Canadian Arts Council. She's received public commissions from the Art on Public Lands Visual Arts Centre of Clarington and the Koffler Gallery in Toronto. Most recently, her work was purchased in 2016 by the Government of Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs to be installed in the new NATO Chancery Building in Brussels, Belgium. That must have been fascinating. What's, what's in Brussels? Well, that, that's not as recent as you make it sound. It was a few years ago now, but um, it still was a highlight. Of, I, I had, so I have uh, three bodies of work. I have the botanicals and I have um, the more figurative work, which is like my animal series. And from that animal series, I did a show, uh, which was uh, basically my bears. And they purchased a tall standing bear for that uh, that's what they bought a tall standing bear yeah and that's what's uh in um in brussels that's what i yes you can uh, yeah it was um so i did a, a series called night elegy 
I've had these bodies of work that I've worked on um, throughout my career that I go back and forth with. Um, and the animals, you know, change all the time. But for this exhibition, it was all about bears. And uh, yeah, so I um, that piece was sold to uh, the government of Canada. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose it's there. They were building it at the time. And I know they opened it a few years ago, I think before COVID. So one day when I get back to Brussels, You'll go stand beside it again. Yeah. Now I understand that uh, both your sister and daughter are uh, are also in uh, are also artists. Is that the case? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I come from quite a uh, you know artistic family, and uh, like I said before, my mother was a, a, a actor, and my sister started out as an actor and then became a director. So she is now an opera director and has a show coming up at the Vancouver uh, Victoria Opera House in February. She's directing a show there. Um, uh, and my young, uh, my eldest daughter is quite a very, a very good artist. And so she's finished a fine arts degree, uh, art history degree at McGill and now is deciding what to do. So I, I pulled the same story on her that my mother pulled on me, which was get your degree, get something you can, you know, because it's such, it, the art world is, is so fickle and it's it's a hard struggle, right, at times. So it's nice to have something solid to fall back on when you're starting out, at least. So is artistic ability genetic? You know, I grew up in a house uh, where my aunts, who were extremely good artists, um, not necessarily allowed at that time. They were a much older generation. Uh, they exhibited their art, but uh, they didn't have sort of a large career, so to say, so to speak. And uh, but I did grow up in a house where they had on the third floor. My aunt had a studio, and uh, she went to art school. Um, and I'm pretty sure that had a you know an impact on me. Yeah. So my mother graduated uh, gold medalist in uh, fine arts from U of T in the early 1950s, but I've got no artistic ability at all. So what happened to me? Who knows, eh? Well, you know what? There's different strokes for different folks. And uh, the other side of the family, they're all lawyers, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think also being encouraged and having an ability and then, you know, all of those things can fall into place. But um yeah. We're chatting tonight with Madeline Lamont, who is a, a Toronto-based uh, artist um, about art. And we're going to take a break for some messages and come back with uh, Madeline in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour and Saga 960. It's a real pleasure of mine to, to review tonight with you uh, Madeline Lamont's art and a little bit of her history, because it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. She's a, a Toronto-based artist. Um, her sister, her, um, her uh, daughter um, are also uh, artists. Her mother uh, was, uh, was, a, was an actress. Um, and so it's interesting that art is certainly uh, genetic and runs in the family. And, uh, and so it's interesting to see, uh, to see some of her art and understand some of her inspiration and some of her training. Um, one of the, the first things that we were going to talk about, um, and, uh, and, and you obviously uh, do a lot of this, is, is botanical. So it's of flowers. Um, why would you do so many drawings of flowers? Um, well, uh, artists have always loved uh, repeating the same motif. It's, it's kind of something that, that we do. Um, I, I certainly remember back in art school being told, you know, that it's okay to have a subject that you are constantly going over. And by doing that continuously, I think you just become more accomplished and more uh, in touch with your subject matter. So I started this botanical series back in, I think, approximately 2004, something like that. Um, I hadn't been that interested in flowers and still lifes up until that point. And when uh, my uh, before mentioned sister uh, moved to Europe and moved to uh, Belgium specifically, 
um, I started going overseas and getting to see the great Dutch masters in the flesh, which is very, very different from studying them in a textbook or in a slide. So I kind of had this uh, newfound appreciation that I didn't really have in art school. And uh, I don't know if I'm like other artists, but you know, when you see something you like, you want to do it. And I certainly wanted to do it, but I did not want to do it in a, in a way that was um, uh, traditional or repetitive, or I wanted to take inspiration from these incredible uh, masters, but make them contemporary in some way. And so uh, I just started painting them. Obviously there's works on canvas uh, that I do. Uh, and there's also works on a material, a paper called mylar. And uh, mylar is akin to a vellum, but it's a man-made plastic paper. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the works of Betty Goodwin, but when I was back in art school, Betty Goodwin, Goodwin a big Canadian painter, was painting on vellum. So it has this translucency, this paper, and I just fell in love with it then and then later on found my subject matter for it. And that was the botanical series. So uh, I play around with, um, the, the, the paper is like a, uh, it's like a plastic, it's frosted, uh, but it has this kind of incredible translucency and opacity at the same time. So it, it, it's this, it has a dichotomy and it's very, very uh, a smooth, fast surface. So you have to be kind of like a, a, a more modern or contemporary painter. You can't, it shows all your mistakes. It's very unforgiving. So your lines are there. You can, you can correct a few things if you like, but um, for the most part, it's a, a very immediate process. And uh, having done it now, for many, many years, um, I feel like it's, you know, I've met my um, tipping point with it in a way, like I've done it, you know, 10,000 times. And I've, I, I feel like it's become more, less representational and more like a psychological uh, portrait or a kind of a psychological experience for myself, almost like, um, I know the subject matter so well, and I think this is what artists who repeat the same thing over and over again uh, experience is that you get to, you become so intimate with a image or a subject matter that it, it then allows you to enter it and do other things. It's almost like a meditation for me now when I, when I paint, uh, particularly the, the Mylars, the botanical series, because I can, um, just sit there and you know how you, when your mind gets very busy this is a, a way to sort of still and distill your uh thoughts i suppose a few questions and, and probably if I could. Quite, hmm. what are you painting with uh, water or uh i'm or painting oil? with oil painting it's oils and um yeah. you you called it uh reputational or realism representational Represent, repre, representational, I apologize, or... or, or kind of real, realism. But a kind of realism, but some it's of, a loose realism. Some of this art looks almost impressionist to me. Yeah. And, you know, maybe in a way, um, while the impressionists were, were using a different palette, I think they were experiencing what I was just talking about in the sense that they were, you know, uh, exploring their own uh, psyche or their own impressions and putting that down as best as they they could. So not being trapped and trying to make everything perfect, um, but allowing yourself this kind of uh, deep dive into, you know, your feelings in a way or your a meditative kind of state where you're just making one decision uh, after another that's either conceptual or it's um, uh, uh, compositional, you know? The I other thing is- I don't know is, if that makes sense. No, I think it does. And, and But the other thing that I've noticed at least, and I'm not, you know, I'm far from an art critic, obviously, but incredible use of light um, where, you know, so much of the, of the painting is dark and, you know, this has got to be, you know, a, a 
what an early morning or a late afternoon uh, or or the light just uh, peering through the forest or something like that that mm -hmm. so much of it is dark but you've got the perfect light right on the uh, the, the buds of the flowers that's yeah. interesting and you don't often see such a a innovative beautiful use of light and and that's something you seem to do a lot of why um uh, there is a there so I just got back from Rome <laughs> a few weeks ago and uh, uh, which was a fantastic trip and got to stand in front of many, many Caravaggios. And he was uh, this incredible painter that developed, the, I, I guess it's a technique called chiaroscuro and that is painting with light. And I never realized, it, I, I mean, I obviously I knew I was doing that because I love contrast um, and I love drama in a painting and I love it to the extent that I love melod making something melodramatic almost and pulling back from it. And I think you know what that's the theater experience of my childhood because my mother was a theater actress and um, I, I just love dramatic and melodramatic uh, expressions and so uh, but going to, to Rome and sitting there and seeing all these great masters, which I'd only, you know, I haven't been there for, a, well, I've never been to Rome and I hadn't been back to Florence for a long time. So I, I can't, I'm just saying I came back um, uh, just uh, uh, enthralled with, again, the works of some of these great masters who paint with light and Caravaggio was one of those. So it's like a sculpture and highlighting that is it becomes a very strong three-dimensional form. And there's something really engaging. I think it engages the viewer that way. And it, it, if you can just get someone to stand in front of, in this kind of mass digital age and rapid edit and all of that, if you can, if, if you can engage with someone to give something time and make it, in, in dramatic enough for them to stay present with the piece. It, I, I, I think that, that, I guess that's a bit of my ambition for that. But um, yeah. Beautiful. And, and a lot of animals. Tell us uh, about your, uh, your painting of animals. So I had, um, uh, alongside of the botanicals for the last 20, 25 years, I've uh, had a series of uh, different animals. So I, I did a large scale exhibition back in 2005 that sort of triggered this. And it was called the Bird Hall. And it was large scale uh, uh, portraits uh, of ostriches. And uh, so the, the ostrich for me felt like this incredible, uh, 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 I had little children at the time, honestly, and was taking them to the Bowmanville Zoo and uh, was just uh, struck by the, the incredible, uh, they're like a dinosaur, really, with these gorgeous feathers. Now, those gorgeous feathers have been used to adorn uh, uh, women and, and costume and uh, the showgirl you know, for forever. So what I wanted to do was take that and in a feminist way, bring you back to the source and present, I, I feel like I present my uh, large scale animals as though they're coming in for their portrait. And they know that there's something uh, specific and perhaps special that they have to um, have their portrait done. It's like a grand, it's a grand salon kind of style thing. Uh, so uh, that series started in 2005 with a, um, a triptych of large ostriches that was called the Three Graces, and they were the Three Graces. If you um, if you uh, you know studied art history at all, or you know uh, religion, are the epitome of female uh, attributes, and I kind of wanted to turn that on its head a little bit. And uh, that's how this whole series started. And then it just continued uh, into all kinds of other animals. So they've been my foil, I suppose, um, for exploring whatever 
ideas like the bear series was um, a, a time where why don't well, we uh, take a break for some messages and we'll come back and chat about sure. the bear series in just a minute yep stay with us everybody we're going to be right back with madeline lamont this meeting is being recorded Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Every week, I try to um, focus on some uh, some um, artists and uh, and and interesting people that. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. We've been chatting about uh, uh, Madeline's background, and it's really quite interesting that uh, she, her uh, her sister, her daughter are all artists. Her mother was an actress. Um, clearly, uh, there's uh, something in the genetics of being an artist. But the other thing that's interesting is she's encouraged her daughter, just like her mother encouraged her, to go out and get something um, academic and slightly practical uh, to start out with uh, in getting a, uh, a, a college degree and, uh, and a fine arts degree before going out and really trying to make it as an artist. Uh, and then we've gone through a whole series of, of paintings that uh, she painted that were botanical of flowers and incredible vibrant uh, colors, uh, oil on an interesting uh, um, material. And I can't remember what the name of the material is that you use, Madeline? Uh, it's a paper called Mylar. Mylar. And, so it's a uh, drafting paper, I and, guess. And, and unbelievable, interesting use of light. And I really quite uh, like that. And now we're, we're gonna talk about a little bit is, uh, is some of the animals. And uh, you've got a whole series of bears. How did you get into painting bears? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to say what triggers the, 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 the first desire to, to, to paint a, a different cre creature. I um, was interested in them. So this exhibition was called Night Elegy. And uh, I mean, I've had interesting, since this exhibition, I've had interesting, um, uh, alter, not altercations, but run-ins with bears. So I, I have a, a place in uh, Northern Ontario, Lake of the Woods. And uh, it's not that I saw many bears there until last summer, until I had one in my kitchen. Uh, you but, had a bear uh, in your kitchen. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great story, but uh, I'll try to focus on the art for now. Artist gets eaten by bear. No, we don't. Uh, bear painter gets attacked by bear. No, we don't want that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I this was a time when um, honestly uh, uh, it was a, the exhibition was titled Night Elegy, and Night Elegy for me, whether uh, for whatever reasons, I had a lot of um, stress going on in my life. I had two parents who were in decline, elderly parents, and my father in particular was suffering from uh, a form of Alzheimer's, and uh, he managed it very, very bravely, and he had quite a few uh, great bear encounter stories in his, uh, that you know, he would uh, tell us as kids so whether that had an influence on it, I don't know. But when you talk about that bear stare, I remember my dad studying very hard and trying very hard to bring up uh, uh, his memories and his information. And uh, there was this kind of gaze uh, that went through him and cycled through. And also, you know, when you, when you encounter a bear, they have a, a characteristic stare that y you don't want to, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's terrifying, but it's like, what are they thinking? They're just this intuitive being that can go either way. Okay, Madeline, either I apologize. Way. I've got to ask you, I've been, I've been looking at your bear painting and I've been moving my head and eyes back and forth and the bear stare follows me as I move my eyes from left to right. How did you accomplish that? You know, with my little creatures that I call them, um, I often don't necessarily look at the animal eye, but I impose a bear, a, a human eye. 
So, but also there is there is a way a, an eye can fall. I don't know whether it's the way you put the the dot of the light in the eye, but they can follow you. But it is a and an, it has the it, it engages the viewer. So sure now does. you have a relationship with that creature. And, and the other thing that's the absolutely fascinating is the motion in the nostrils. How did you capture that? You know, the, the nostrils are amazing. They're, they're showing uh, the bear breathing and growling and the power. Well, it's like you're, it, it, it's like you're being confronted with the other that is also a metaphor uh, about yourself. So you're, it's almost like I wanted to create, you know, obviously it's a creature, but it's, a, it's become almost a mythological creature, even though we understand it as a bear. But um, I, uh, I wanted to just create this um, kind of dynamic energy. He's also very calm. Eh? He's not aggressive. But My those bears paws are, are showing. Aggressive. They're thoughtful. The paws. The paws are showing incredible power. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And and the, their nails are important to display. And by the way, the little bear that was in my kitchen, the baby bear, the first thing I saw when I went down was his exquisite paws. And I thought, well, that's not my brother's dog. <laughs> Those paws belong to somebody else. And uh, they're, they're, they're beautiful. It's like, so you, it, it, I think with the paws, what I wanted to describe was this sense of power, but I'm not, uh, you know, this is an incredible overwhelming cre a creature that could overwhelm you easily but it's not going to it's just looking at you and you're looking back at it so um i mean it, uh, it, i i also the reason i called it night elegy is because i got up at night uh oftentimes in the middle of the night and and painted this series because i couldn't sleep for whatever reason i was uh, had my own uh anxiety or you know when when you have someone close to you that you know is in decline or uh you know at that point my dad was probably um at uh, uh at deer lodge hospital which is a veterans hospital and i just knew he was up and pacing back and forth going when am i getting out of here why <laughs> why am i here and i i i could feel that and that's an incredible, it's an agony. So the elegy part is like, you, you're, you have to move through this um, phase, I guess, this system of, of, of being aware. You know, it's the monsters that come out at night, but this wasn't necessarily about monsters. The bears are not monstrous, they're thoughtful. And that was my motivation for this series. And then sometimes I have, like, if you if you scroll down below, uh, I have these very large. The, all of them are very large in scale. So that one is an is you know five by five painting on mylar. So it's an enormous head and an enormous gaze at you. So it's confrontational, but in, in a way that is it's not threatening but it's asking you to wonder what I'm thinking, you know? So this one is a uh, polar bear. And uh, so I call this one Sebastian and he was sold to a very nice uh, couple, uh, friends of mine now, very good friends of mine now. And uh, I have, he's a standing polar bear, kind of set in a bit of an Arctic background but he also came into my studio. So if you see on the side of the painting, there's this beautiful uh, pipe, this red pipe that comes down. So he's in an industrial space and he's not in the Arctic. He's come in for his portrait to be painted. He's sitting. He doesn't look, you know, like the he queen doesn't look fierce. In a portrait. He doesn't look fierce. He looks kind of quizzical. Wondering what you're yeah, doing. He does. And if you notice on him, he's been riddled with these darts. So St. Sebastian was shot full of arrows. And uh, what I want, uh, if you, you, you know, he was crucified with arrows. And this bear, this is polar bear. This is 
you know, I guess hearkening to some kind of a Canadian identity or, a, you know, uh, and he's shot full of arrows. So there has been an attempt to sedate and he's still standing or she, she's still standing and she's doesn't, it's almost become, she's become spirit. So you can try as you will to sedate with all of these shooting darts, which are kind of uh, emblematic of the arrows that shot St. Sebastian on the crucifix. But again, and, I think um, one of the interesting things that I've noticed is again, your use of light, where the light's coming from one side and you've got the light um, you know, showing uh, to the right of the painting and on the right side of, uh, of the bear. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, a very interesting use of, uh, of light in your painting. I think I, I probably use light. Uh, it's not naturalistic light. Like it's not like I have a, a something that's shone on it. I just use it in a way that I want you to highlight this thing. So I never want it to appear totally natural. Like, is this a spotlight coming from here? Is this thing glowing? Is something coming from within and it's glowing? So it gives him a kind of, uh, What's the word I'm thinking? Maybe ephemeral kind of spiritual quality, I guess. So I've, I've got to share with you uh, my bear story. Um, I, yes. uh, I, I, I was uh, an out tripper in Algonquin Park at one point in time doing canoe trips. And uh, we had a, uh, a very senior out tripper uh, from Algonquin Park come and tell us that often bears would attack um, or at least come uh, to campsites at night. And, uh, and a couple of things, first thing you wanted to do was try to scare them away by banging pots and pans. Um, the third thing you did is you cannot show fear um, because uh, if, if you show fear that they would attack, uh, the third yeah. thing you uh, don't ever want to do is run uphill because uh, they're made for running up hills um, and oh. they can't run down hills. And so if you've got a hill, run downhill because they'll do a tumble and somersault because their back paws are so much longer than their front paws. Yes, so uphill, right. They're great. And then the last thing they said was if you get in a fight, you only get one shot because what they do is they stand up and they club once and they decide who's the stronger club. And, uh, and, oh. and so you, you got one punch and he said, uh, yeah. the one thing you got to do is you got to take out your paddle and swing it as hard as you can at the side okay. of the bear's head and try to tell the bear that you're the stronger one. The problem is the bear gets his one swing too. Yeah, uh, I, I can see that. So, I mean, just hearkening back to my little bear story, I heard this clutter going on and I thought, oh, isn't that nice? My husband's gone down to make the coffee for me, you know, for a change. Oh, that's great. But what kind of a mess is, what is going on? And then I realized, oh, he's still there. So I creep downstairs and I see this gorgeous baby cub in my, at my back door. And this was this summer. So the bears were starving. They were all coming into Kenora. There'd been lots of bear sightings and he had come in through this high window. And of course, the, the biggest fear is where's mama? Where is mama going to be? And uh, like you said, I, I knew enough that I had to shout at him, but I didn't want to freak him out. But I just shouted him very determined. Can you go? <laughs> and he turned around, he looked at me and he crawled straight up the wall and went out the window. And then we thought, well, where is mother? So for seven years, I've had a bear horn on a shelf in my kitchen. Guess bear what? Bear horn. Bear horn, like a bear, uh, like a, a, you know, a boat thing that to scare bears. And it was not there because somebody put it in the drawer. <laughs> and you're panicking. So uh, all of a sudden, I hear my husband yelling, she's outside, she's outside. And there, were, there she was with her two cubs and they started to take off. All of a sudden, she turned around and came running back to the cottage. And we thought, holy shit. Oh, excuse me, excuse my French on radio. Um, and uh, we, we panicked a bit. Then she grabbed this bundle of pink insulation and tore through the woods with it, turned around and pivoted. And we thought, well, you know, that's a good mother for you. She went all this effort. She was not going to leave empty handed. And, uh, but we were sh so shook up. They did appear the next morning. And this is how I scared them away then. 
I played an awful, god awful heavy metal rock music. Bears don't like heavy metal rock music, I guess. They do not. They might like Celine Dion. I'm not sure. That was the first channel. I thought this isn't working. And then it was something like Sticks, sorry, for rock music. And they were like, I, we are going, okay? We're out of here. We're going to go. So. We're going to take a break um, and come back with uh, a few landscapes uh, to uh, finish our conversation tonight with Madeline Lamont. Stay with us, everybody. This meeting is being recorded. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. I've been enjoying um, reviewing some of uh, Madeline Lamont's art tonight. And uh, we've gone through a bunch of uh, pictures of, uh, of flowers, her botanical series, and, uh, and, and, and vibrant colors and use of light. And then uh, some animal series, particularly um, uh, what, ostriches and bears. And, uh -huh. uh, and, and the bears particularly... Um, you know, incredible eyes and uh, being able to sort of capture their motion and, uh, and their fierceness, even though they were standing still. Uh, and I love the way that, uh, you know, the nostril was like twisted around as if it was uh, grunting huge amounts of hot air uh, through, uh, through those nostrils. Uh, and, and then you've also done some landscapes. And, um, and I'd like to, if you could, tell me a little bit about landscapes and, and what your style is there and, and, and uh, what you're trying to describe with your landscapes. Uh, well, I've had a, a series of, I almost call them weather systems. So uh, many, many years ago, I started out uh, with a, a kind of a miniature, usually my landscapes start very small. And then they're allowed to uh, grow at a certain pace when I feel confident about them. And uh, I started this series of uh, tornadoes. Now, this is not tornadoes. These are, uh, it's very difficult as an artist to take on, you know, the history of the group of seven, right? So in a way, I kind of resisted it for probably a decade. And then, um, you know, being it, going every summer to this landscape, I decided, well, it's time. And uh, it, it's the place that I, you, you, I can understand where um, those painters, uh, how they drew from the, the, this incredible landscape and the, the way that the trees are shaped by the wind. Basically, it's like you're pushing against a weather system all the time. So, uh, they started off small, this series. I call it Lake of the Woods just because that's where I go every summer and have been for a long time. And um, uh, again, uh, most of them are kind of uh, sunset or stormy. So they're either serene and calm or, you know, fighting the good fight. And... Uh, yeah, so there again, I, I kind of maybe think about them in terms of being like a psychological state that you want to achieve and, and a, or a gesture. They're kind of, um, they're, some of them, the ones on canvas take more time, but the ones on mylar on the paper are very gestural. They're almost like a, uh, um, you, you know, a quick, very quick. So that would be one on canvas that takes time. Canvas always takes time to build up layers and the works on paper on the mylar are mostly about removing your layers. Now, so Matt, you had described uh, your uh, botanical series uh, as, um, as almost realism. These are almost abstract. Yeah, they're becoming more abstract for sure. Yeah. If you look close at the uh, botanicals, I mean, they, they hold their shape and they have a composition that you recognize. Uh, but the actual execution of them is, is pretty loose. And, and these ones are these ones are very loose, I guess, um, and more abstracted. And I think it's because I'm looking at them um, from a distance. So they're always, uh, you know, uh, um, farther away and i think that is uh, that makes them more abstract it's like you're trying to get close but you can't necessarily get close 
Well, thank you so much for sharing with us uh, your talent. Uh, I really appreciate it. If people want to check out your art, um, do they do it online or are you at a gallery or what's the best way to, to do that? I have uh, two galleries currently and myself. So you can always reach me, uh, Madeline Lamont um, on Instagram or, at, and basically that's where I post most of my work, new work is on Instagram. And that's been a great uh, tool for me. I have a, a gallery here in Toronto called Art Interiors. And uh, while they don't put on exhibitions per se, they have a, a, a great deal of my work in their back room. Um, and they work with a lot of uh, designers and uh, clients. So they've been, well, I've been with them for many, many, many years now. And then out west in Calgary, I'm with a Christine Clausen Gallery. And I usually have a formal exhibition with her every 18 months, something like that. But you know, you have you can reach out to me through Instagram, and that's really the that's been my tool of choice. I have tried to refrain a little bit from overposting, but you can scroll through, and if you see something you like, then you can con message me and contact me, and I'll tell you what I have available. Well, I absolutely love uh, this uh, painting of the sunset, um, and uh, and the trees and the lake. And, uh, and the shore, because I can imagine that I'm on that shore and I'm about to get into a canoe. I almost wish that you had a little bit of a bow of a canoe showing at the bottom, because that's what I want to jump in and go out and paddle on this lake and uh, enjoy this gorgeous sunset. Um, where is this? Is this Lake of the Woods? Uh, this, is, this is Lake of the Woods, too. This was a commission for a very dear friend of mine. And uh, yeah, that's her view from her deck. And I do do commissions, and uh, but this one was um, a gorgeous sunset. She sent me and said, "Please paint this for me." So I did that, and it was. It, I think it worked out. And then, uh, just on uh, on Christmas uh, Day, my kids asked me to uh, to sing a song about the other day. I met a bear, a great big bear, way up there, and uh, I can't help but think of that song when I see this painting those fierce eyes. What a beautiful bear. Well, you can go out singing it. <laughs> the other day, I met a bear, a great big bear away up there. Thanks so much, Madeline Lamont, for joining us tonight and sharing with us your art. And thank you so much for sharing your talent with the world. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, that's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. Um, and uh, Madeline Lamont, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your art with us. Really appreciate it. Okay, great.